Well, good morning and welcome to London as we're going to talk today with Richard Ballantyne, uh, uh, the Chief Executive of British Ports Association. And Richard's here to discuss the post-pandemic container surges and global supply chain issues. And I think we're going to have a fun conversation knowing Richard about a whole variety of things from international trade uh, through the shipping industry and on out to sustainability and labor issues and all sorts of good subjects. Anyway, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. And I'm able to host so many of these webinars uh, with my fellow chairman because of the tolerance of our sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely over technology, economics, and finance. Now, as we know, uh, the vast bulk of global trade goes by ship, uh, and the shipping industry has been transformed since the 1950s with the advent of containers. We'll be touching on that as we go ahead. And Britain, of course, has always been a maritime nation. And therefore, although Rich is going to be giving us a, a lot of facts and figures about what's happening in our ports here in the United Kingdom, uh, many of these trends are exhibiting themselves around the world. And Richard does have an overall global view of the world. Uh, I, I hope we all have a global view of the world, but uh, Richard has a particularly good and wide ranging one. The uh, format today, as ever, will be that I'll get out of the way as quickly as possible. Uh, yes, this is being recorded and you can share with friends and family and colleagues in a couple of days. Uh, yes, the slides are available. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And in fact, I believe they'll be posted quite rapidly. Um, but finally, the most important thing is to participate in the questions and answers. That's the great thing about these series, an opportunity to hear it direct from the source and answer the questions that you would like. But to do so, you do need to use the GoTo uh, Q&A facility uh, on your screen. I'm here with you, so I'm not on Signal or WhatsApp or or tweeting or emailing. So feed the feed the questions in and I'll get them into a conversation with Richard. Uh, as an aside, all of the questions and answers will be sent to Richard and they will have your email attached. So if you want some particular point of detail or something, uh, feel free to stick it in there. We'll make sure that he gets it. Now, um, just before we get cracking, uh, Richard and I thought it'd be good to kind of uh, up your knowledge of things. So we have uh, two poll questions and uh, behind the scenes, Peter, would you mind launching the first uh, question? which is, you know, what is the UK's largest port by tonnage? So is it uh, London, Grimsby and Immingham, Dover or Felixstowe? So very quickly, audience out there, uh, your thoughts. Just hit the uh, hit the buttons there. Michael, I'm saying I was interested to see, um, it's good morning, everyone, but I'm interested to see whether uh, people around the globe have heard of places like Grimsby and Immingham. It's quite a... <laughs> Very traditional well, British. Let's see. We're just going to show the results there, Richard, and uh, it's kind of what you suspected. Um, Felix Stowe uh, gets the highest by tonnage, but hold on a moment before we give you the answer to that one. We have another question for you, and then Richard is going to give you the answers. So here we have: What is the UK's largest container port? You know, so is it uh, London Gateway, Southampton, Felix Stowe again, or Liverpool? Ah, the, the voters out there are a bit more perplexed, uh, Richard. We've got uh, folks, uh, there we are. Okay, most of the audience has voted. We'll just uh, show you the results there. Uh, and obviously everybody's down on London, but a bit of a tie between Southampton, Felixstowe and Liverpool. So Richard, what is the largest port by tonnage? Uh, good morning, everyone, as I said, and uh, well, hello to everyone around the, around the world. It's great to be with you, Michael. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, I think, it, Michael, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a trick question, I have to say. So according to the Department for Transport here in the UK, our maritime statistics uh, body, it's the Port of London. But actually, uh, Grimsby and Immingham are in the north of the UK on an area around the Humber estuary. And if you combine all the Humber terminals with Grimsby and Immingham, um, then you can actually get an aggregated larger volume. But that's, sorry, that's the rather nerdy trick question. Great. And on containers? Containers, it is indeed Felixstowe, which is um, uh, one of our oldest and certainly largest uh, container ports. But London Gateway is investing and, you know, it is a free port, which uh, we can perhaps come to a bit later. And they're investing in a new berth and we should see volumes race up uh, in London. So uh, and there are many, Michael, who predict that London will be the largest container handling port facility in certainly in the next generation or so. Fantastic. 
Well, Richard, um, I know you've got a few slides to get the conversation going, and the floor is very much yours. Yes, as I say hello, and it's great to be with you. Thank you again, Michael. So uh, just uh, introduce myself, uh, Richard Ballantyne. I'm from the British Ports Association, and this is a trade body uh, for ports and harbours here in the UK. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Peter? Um, and what are we? This is what well, I'm not going to dwell too long on this, don't worry, but this is how I describe our propaganda. Uh, we are that membership body for all types of ports and harbours. Uh, so the largest, like London and Grimsby, but also a lot of small recreational, leisure, fishing ports, etc., uh, marine terminals um, dotted around the country. And we have over 400 of such facilities in our membership. Uh, they're all unified by either their status or the fact that they uh, have legal duties and responsibilities uh, and safety responsibilities, uh, but they do vary in different size and quantities. Uh, we also have a, a strong network, ne network of membership bodies, uh, sorry, of, uh, uh, of connected bodies who are service suppliers to our sector as well. So if anyone wants further details about that, get in touch. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so just to give a bit of a overview of where we are here in the UK, and don't worry, I'm not going to dwell exclusively on the UK. We're just using uh, Britain as a good example about what's happened and what is happening both for trade and also as a result of the pandemic. So you'll see uh, this chart, this this maps uh, tonnages through the, uh, the last 20 years or so, and you will see that liquid bulk, so sort of big oil um, and kind of gas type products, that is gradually declining as the cut as the, the global the globe moves towards decarbonisation uh, and one or two other factors. Whereas uh, containers, we have seen a sort of steady drive and, and you know unitised freight. So that's boxes of things usually carried uh, by containers, but also on the back of lorries, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, uh, th those two um, trades are row row and containers. They are growing gradually, but we have seen a bit of a dip in the last couple of years. Uh, as a result of Brexit, as a result of the pandemic, and one or two other factors. Uh, but you'll see dry bulks as well, and that could include things like coal. And gradually in the UK, um, the government is moving towards decarbonisation. As I said earlier, uh, that means that we don't have as many, if any, uh, coal fueled power stations anymore. We've moved over to things like biomass, which has had a net impact uh, on our port tonnages. Now, the next slide, please. Uh, but that is what it's going to look like moving forward. And you will see unitized that I mentioned, that's row, row and low, low. So load on, load off, and roll on, roll off. So the containers that we're going to talk about uh, it shortly, you'll see that is forecast to grow substantially uh, out for the ne next 20, uh, 25 years or so. Uh, and uh, other areas like liquid bulks are going to continue to decline gradually, although we're still going to be very reliant on uh, those types of commodities for energy and other fuels, etc. Can I have the next slide, please? So just to set in the global context where Britain and Europe and North America is in terms of our uh, container trades. So it won't be a great surprise, Michael and others, to know that uh, a lot of goods are manufactured in Asia. Uh, they could be toys, they could be uh, clothes, they could be furniture, uh, a whole range of things are manufactured there, electronic equipment, etc. And they are shipped round uh, in containers uh, uh, and it takes around 30 to 40 days for those containers to get round to places like North America. Uh, the most traditional route and, and the most efficient route typically is via the Suez Canal uh, and we'll touch on what happened in Suez briefly later. Uh, but they sail around and sometimes those containers can be unloaded and transshipped onto different ports. But a lot of the activity is going into those big hub ports in places like Rotterdam and Hamburg and Antwerp, etc., which have uh, on continent in the continent of Europe, they have huge hinterlands of big populations of Germany and France and, you know, Central Europe, etc. And, uh, and, and other uh, Fed countries and by Fed, I mean, transshipped countries where containers can be offloaded and put onto smaller vessels and go up to places like Scandinavia, Britain uh, and further afield. Uh, Britain, of course, still does have some direct lines with China and some very healthy services indeed. So we can welcome some of the largest container ships. Uh, and you'll see a picture there on the right. That's um, uh, London Gateway on the Thames. So in Michael's part of the world, or a little bit further out. 
and that's one of our newest facilities down there which is has been uh, was opened about seven or eight years ago uh, uh, from scratch and effectively is seizing on the opportunity of containers and unitized freight and our trade with uh, Asia but also with other parts of the world you get some African trades and commodities and indeed even some South American commodities including foods and other perishables are now coming through on containers to places like London Gateway because so it really can accommodate all types of commodities and even we still we see some uh, scrap metals and other commodities being loaded and exported from the UK in containers so it really is a, a growing uh, area can I have the next slide please so what happened in the pandemic so this is um, uh, forgive the slight dense um, uh, text uh, on this slide uh, and as I said these will be shared so you can pick up any of the details on these but what happened effectively the first thing you'll recall is the Chinese economy was locked down back in early 2020 when they started um, testing and getting um, COVID as, as a prevalent, unfortunately, in their population. That had a, a material impact on uh, manufacturing, on factories, on exports from China, and it really did slow things down. And we saw in the UK that lag I mentioned, that 30 to 40 day lag uh, started to uh, take uh, take effect. And we had things like panic buying, which um, you know some of us may uh, have a, as a distant, me distant memory, but I'm sure that was uh, prevalent around the world as well. And not just with things like toilet rolls, there were lots of things that we went short on. And effectively, um, a lot of people in the UK increased their demands. So they effectively increased order books to Asia and, and other parts of the world for other commodities. And they were rushing to get goods in. But as I said before, those ships just weren't leaving uh, Chinese ports with anything on them and and so we had a bit of a lull effectively then fast forward a few weeks and as you saw the virus spread through the Mediterranean up to northern Europe and into places like Britain we of course then responded as did much of Europe and North America with our own lockdowns which uh, had an impact on uh, things like non-essential um, uh, purchases etc so shops and goods and manufacturing slowed down in Britain and we just didn't need a lot of these goods that we'd over ordered for. Meanwhile a lot of the goods are now um, having China partially opened up. A lot of these goods are now being shipped round to Britain but that lag, that time delay of a, of a month plus meant that when goods arrived there was a bit of congestion unloading and discharging the goods because there just simply wasn't de the demand. Uh, and a lot of those goods came in uh, and they went into storage facilities uh, some of them stayed at ports, which caused uh, logistic issues. And, and it really was a sort of perfect storm of uh, problems as we, we, we really suffered as, uh, as a global economy and particularly here in, in Britain. We just didn't need a lot of these goods. So then you, you, get, you get in the situation, we start needing other things like PPE and other equipment, which was being produced elsewhere, like uh, Asia and, uh, and Eastern Europe, et cetera. And that was being shipped in. And you had a very complicated dynamic where some of the essential um, um, goods were being flown in by air freight. But as Michael mentioned at the beginning uh, of the uh, of the session, 90% uh, of global trade is carried by sea. So we were still importing some of those bits of PPE and other commodities through in containers in the sort of traditional way. Um, and uh, some of that was being held up at our container ports as governments and others, health services around um, Northern Europe and, and, and North America were uh, demanding um, such goods, but not having necessarily the capability of collecting or pushing it through ports. This then coupled with a, a slight problem in a lack of empty containers, uh, where the empty containers are traditionally shipped out of places like North America, and Northern Europe, back to Asia where you know, effectively they're back to source so they can be restocked with goods. That started to be a, a, a real problem and generally there was a bit of a trade imbalance. And all this time, Michael, there was an increase in shipping costs uh, and it's something that since the recession in 2008, global container freight rates and shipping costs have been fairly low, it has to be said, and it's been pretty cost efficient to import goods from the Far East to Britain or elsewhere uh, because of those low costs. But what we saw is that the shipping lines who'd had a, has to be said, a fairly torrid time since the last recession 
were really, you know, their services were in demand and, and obviously we know what happens there. So the, the cost went up uh, and, and a lot of importers in the UK who were facing uh, and elsewhere facing really torrid economic circumstances were now seeing not only, you know, um, a, a kind of destabilized domestic economy, they were also seeing massive increases and delays uh, in their imports. And, and Britain is an import heavily reliant economy. Uh, we, you know, where there's a big trade imbalance. We don't, because of the economic changes in Britain in the 1980s and 1990s, we don't have that manufacturing or mater raw materials extraction base that we we had previously. So we do rely on international trade, both from Europe and uh, and also Asian further afield, etc. But all these things, as I mentioned, a perfect storm, uh, sort of um, sort of factored in to cause a, 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 a challenge and. And it was particularly prevalent as we came out of the pandemic or moved through the pandemic and it hung about. So, um, you know, a lot of the, the goods that were brought into the UK, it could be something like garden furniture or seasonal clothes. They weren't really needed by shops towards the, the end of the summer, but they might have had a summer life. So then you had an issue of whether you, you chuck those things away or you put them into storage. And that put more pressures on the supply chain and our uh, storage capabilities, warehousing, et cetera. So it really did boil up uh, into a, a perfect storm. Factor in other economic circumstances like uh, preparations for various Brexit deadlines uh, here in the UK, uh, it, it, it really kind of threw our trade into a bit of disarray. And we had lots of media coverage uh, of the maritime sector, the seaports, particularly container ports, um, demonstrating how um, whilst the UK was heavily reliant on these ports, there was definitely pressures and issues, which many people, if you were, a, a, you know, an importer in the Midlands, could be toys for Christmas. You know, you were getting quite excited about what uh, your supply uh, chains were looking like and your order books were looking like. So that um, volatility sort of um, continued through, and and then, of course, uh, there are various peaks and troughs: Christmas, Chinese New Year, etc., uh, in the global um, shipping calendar calendar and and of course um just over a year ago we had the um quite tremendously amazing situation of the suez canal being blocked for over, just over a week or so and and that effectively was was a major so a major challenge and it it made that bottleneck that the suez canal is uh it, it stopped traffic going through we looked at people looked at alternative routes but that really did have a major um continuing impact and i think it it begs the question michael are we always going to be at the, the beck and, uh, you know, the, 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 the mercy of global shipping events, which may cause such pressures now in the 24 hour media environment where everybody wants to um, uh, focus on that. So can I have the next slide, please, Peter? So just to, um, you know, kind of underline, I think what I was saying, this, this is a, a stat that you might find easier to look at after the event um the, the most shocking thing on this is the picture of the ever given of course of the suez canal uh, and looking at what had to be undertaken there in the maritime community this really was i mean it was a big story globally but you can imagine the maritime community everything from the insurance markets through to the logistics side of things and the shipping uh, shipping safety uh, divisions of everybody we all looked at this very closely and um, you know the way the suez canal is managed, I think, is being reviewed, etc. The number of pilots, the maritime pilots you get on vessels was reviewed. Really was a, a quite an amazing circumstance. But this, uh, you'll see the figures um, on, on the uh, on the left there with uh, import figures. It just shows the sort of volatility, I think, uh, of sort of such instances like COVID, uh, like Brexit, and, and particularly things like the Ever Given, etc. Although, of course, the Ever Given was a very short term incident. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Peter? So the question, I think, and it'd be quite interesting one, I don't know whether anyone's got any points um, uh, where, where you are to raise on volatility, because I think, um, you know, it is a very global issue. Um, but you'll see there's some kind of headline figures on volatility growing up, container line schedule, re reliability dropping, etc. And I think that's something we, we're expecting is, is here to stay. Although I have to say the shipping lines in the container sector have done a great job of um, managing to improve things because, you know, we're in a pretty dire situation around the world. And it's not just Britain, North America. We had a huge amount of reported empty containers being stored well away from ports, sometimes in the middle of the country. 
and the container sector has now been working to try and relocate those back to get them back into the supply chain so that we're not in in a shortage that the pressures the shipping industry have had is very much that they want to get going because it's a very profitable time to ship so they don't really want to have to hang around in some of my members ports and, and other ports waiting for empty containers to be loaded on which might take a very long time to extract and load on and also disrupt following ships which are coming in so uh, those kind of pressures are fairly unique to our sector can I have a next slide please so just um, you know just to finish off really um uh, brexit you know i tried not to mention this too much uh, but effectively in case you didn't know if you're not in britain and, and elsewhere uh, the UK voted to leave the European Union and that meant we have left, of course, now, uh, but only relatively recently, the EU single market and the customs union. And for trade, that means that we had previously we had a, a kind of an aligned an arrangement where you wouldn't have um, uh, customs or border controls uh, within, within that union. But we, of course, do now in Britain. We've left our nearest trading partner and for political reasons, but the net effect of trade has been rather negative in that you get all these extra costs and delays and processes at the border, which have uh, taken a lot of time to, to upskill and get people ready for. New IT systems have been built, new physical infrastructure has been built, both in Britain and in uh, the European Union. Uh, and it, let's just say it's gone rather well, I think, for the government's perspective in terms of trade. But it is having an increased um, impact on costs and we are seeing declining numbers or volumes of trade which are, you know for a ports uh, grouping is is never a good thing we want to see ports busy etc uh, and so much so that new um, the, the new systems i mentioned there were new controls physical controls due to come in uh, in july in britain which was the, the sort of final piece of the jigsaw in terms of um, brexit controls uh, where you'd have physical inspections of animal and plant products, so sanitary and phytosanitary controls, so inspections of consignments of beef or grain or other uh, animal uh, or um, uh, plant-based products, etc. Now, that's quite a costly process. You have to build facilities as that, as I mentioned. You have to pay for the for the privilege of having those inspected, and uh, and some of them may be uh, you know caught up for some time, impacting the efficiency. Government has seen that in the UK has seen that with those increased costs um, uh, factored in with the increasing cost of living and increasing fuel costs around um, the globe. It has decided to temporarily uh, postpone those costs and probably not have as um, a tough regime in 2024, which could ban a lot of our infrastructure we've built for this uh, redundant, which is quite an amazing time. But, but there you go, that's something perhaps for a, a kind of a discussion over a pint here in England or somewhere else. Uh, and then finally, um, there is drives in the UK from the UK government to deregulate uh, all parts of the economy, uh, but particularly ports. We're looking at the European Port Services Regulation as one of the examples we regularly use, which could be removed. And we now have a free port strategy, which um, is, is perhaps... Uh, sort of early stages, but we're seeing three ports rolled out in England and they will follow in the rest of the UK shortly. Have the uh, final slide, please, Peter. So that's it from me, uh, Michael. That's uh, here for some questions. I hope that was on time, but um, back to you. Well, Richard, it was absolutely spot on time. In fact, 60 seconds early. Uh, secondly, it was very cogent and informative. I really learned a lot. And yes, we do in fact have a, a large number of questions out there. Um, just, just to get cracking, you closed uh, on free ports and Mark Cook is interested in this as am I. Firstly, could you just quickly explain to our listeners, what is this free port concept? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question, um, Michael. So free ports, some people may have heard of this as free trade zones and essentially have several sort of types of iterations around Britain, around Europe and uh, and the Far East, Middle East, and Northern Europe, of course, uh, sorry, North America. And essentially this is a, a zone around a airport or a seaport where you can create a more business friendly environment, uh, regulatory regimes, et cetera. Primarily in the past, they focused on customs easements and tariffs where you can suspend duties that are, that are payable on goods to mean you can bring things in, you can transship them, you can turn them into something else. 
and get them out in a cheaper, more cost efficient way. Uh, we've seen more recently, um, particularly in the Middle East, uh, zones have had tax benefits where you're, you're also incentivized companies to come in and set up facilities, whether they be manufacturing or transshipment based. And so the UK government has learned that lesson and, and included that in its free port strategy, as well as uh, other easements like local business rates, uh, employment incentives, so it's cheaper to, to employ people for the first three years of their careers, etc. And finally, um, although perhaps more underwhelmingly, although it is supposed to be included, we have planning easements in these sites, which effectively is across all ports at the moment, or certainly in England. And that is supposed to mean that the whole package and, and, and zone is much more attractive for inward investment. So people coming in to build facilities, I mentioned manufacturing, could be factories, uh, it could be something else to do with offshore renewable energy or some new sector uh, to come in and invest. That's that's what the vision is. And um, so the government has, has latched onto this. Now, it is, it's not true to say you couldn't do this in the European Union. Indeed, we have a lot of legacy free uh, port areas in the European Union, uh, primarily around uh, tax and, and, and tariffs, etc. But they do exist. But it was seen as a, as a great sort of, you know, um, uh, opportunistic uh, policy from government to say we've left the, the EU, the shackles are off, we can do what we like. So they picked, they had a competition and we've got eight locations around England and there'll be two more in Scotland, probably one in Wales and, and something in Northern Ireland shortly. Daniel Gunter points out that this uh, concept isn't really comparable therefore to duty-free and this is a much wider involving planning and land and all. Uh, why not make the entire UK a free port? Well, indeed, we did uh, actually lobby for that rather, you know, che uh, cheekily, Michael. But yes, no, we're sympathetic. Now, we I mentioned at the beginning we have over 400 ports and harbours. Now, some of those won't be sort of relevant to sort of international trade type activities. But we do have a lot of locations around the country that were interested and indeed were not greeted or granted the status and indeed some airports as well. So, yes, we're, we're with you there. Um, just out of curiosity, what was the EU reaction to this? So Mark Cook is interested. Yeah, quite suspicious, actually. I think our, our counterparts in European ports were very interested to come to events like this to learn a little bit more and to follow the developments. And the Commission was a little bit suspicious when we were negotiating the free trade deal. But I think they um, they, they kind of understand now that perhaps um, they're not going to be as um, disruptive as perhaps the UK or others would want. But But equally, they are watching them carefully. Okay. Uh, two quick questions from Hugh Purser on your presentation. Uh, could you define unitized freight? Uh, yeah, <laughs> TEU is the um, is the, uh, the the metric used around the world. So that's twenty equivalent units, twenty foot equivalent unit, and effectively that's um, yeah. Usually a large container is forty foot, but the twenty foot are the smaller containers you might have seen on the back of a lorry. Uh, it's it's a kind of a, that that metric that measurement is is a unit that is applicable around the world it's it's not the same as tonnage of course uh, although you know the, the tonnages are, are closely linked well that was actually his next question how strong is the correlation between tonnage and value uh well value is something else actually so value can be anything because if you're bringing in high value um goods from the far east like electric electric equipment you know tvs and iPhones and all those kind of wonderful devices, uh, some of which are shipped, that will have a very high value. But then you get some, you know, kind of uh, other less valuable products that um, that may take up uh, maybe fairly bulky, etc. So the value depends on the commodity in in the unit. Uh, in terms of um, weight, well, typically, you know, the heavier something is, it might be more valuable. But it really does depend on what you're carrying and the value of the commodity. Uh, Manfred Lamb uh, has got a couple of questions as well. Um, so the first one is there's been a lot of talk about localization of supply chains in the last couple of years. And he was wondering if BPA has any uh, evidence, observations to support that view, uh, perhaps in some segment like general cargo or unitized freight. Have you seen anything about localization or maybe shipping routes being localized? Well, I mean, is this in, Michael, do you think this is in respect to the pandemic and looking at nearshoring? Do you think that's the... the yeah, the, I believe so. Yes, I think um, what we find, Michael, is there is always, when you get a crisis, an emergency, you get a kind of supply chain issue, you will get those logistics managers in, you know, not just at ports, 
the, those people who are importing the commodities, you'll get government officials and ministers looking at the resilience of supply chains. And I think it's fair to say that COVID did prompt that. And there was an expectation that people might look to nearshore and indeed produce stuff domestically, which uh, you know would be great for the UK. And indeed, Britain, British ports could start exporting more because we don't export a huge amount, or certainly not as much as some of our European competitors. But ironically, you know, at this time when we're leaving the European Union uh, and that sort of that union of trade that we had, uh, which obviously was for sort of political reasons, the reason we left, but le leaving that trading block, uh, it's ironic now that, you know, perhaps there is a focus on nearshoring. My, my guess is that effectively, as things settle down, uh, people will look at um, the their you know the the value and uh, and the sensitivity of their supply chains a bit closer but i think we'll continue as is uh, and unless there are major instances like you know for example the russian situation in ukraine you can't i can't see a huge change in sort of established trading links because effectively it's the cheapest and most efficient way for a lot of traders to act okay um, an interesting point also from Manfred, um, and, and it's um, really on roll on, roll, roll off. Um, you've, uh, what have been the main drivers to an increasing use of RORF and how might that affect the overall value chain from, you know, from port operator to shipping companies to warehousing logistics? So quite a big factor is in terms of short sea roll on, roll off shipping uh, and effectively you know roll on roll off does compete in some respects to short sea containers um and a lot of it as you will you know no doubt in britain certainly in parts of europe you would have seen headlines of places like the port of dover which is europe's busiest row row port where lorries are driven on with the traffic with the with the containers or the goods and then driven through when you arrive in britain etc but what we've seen uh, because of brexit the, the fear and the prospect of new controls on those types of traffics, which could really hold up lorry drivers for, you know, extended periods of time, unlike containers where you just stack a box and wait for the customs authority to give approval and then clear it out. The, the focus has been very much looking at alternative routes or certainly the, the political focus has. And it's fair to say that um, instead of, for example, using Great Britain as a land bridge between the Republic of Ireland uh, on in the West and continental Europe in the East, we've now seen people bypass Britain by shipping it direct. Now you're not doing that with a lorry driver on board now. So it's a dropped trailer, we call it. And that 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 is definitely increased. Uh, and we've seen, uh, you know, unaccompanied trailers, uh, those that, that compete with containers increase substantially around UK. Whereas uh, roll on, roll off conventional driver accompanied freight has declined somewhat, but that's all now being rebalanced. And, and ironically, things like our uh, haulage shortage in Britain, which was prompted by things like dep the departure from the EU with a lot of Eastern European drivers going home, uh, has meant that it's still uh, quite an efficient way to use a, a foreign based driver to come into Britain and go back with the same vehicle instead of having a domestic driver. Well, uh, no conversation about uh, business and economics these days seems to avoid the climate change issues. Um, and of course, you know, shipping is an interesting area where, you know, it's 90 percent of trade. I think it, I think the number is something like 1.5 tons per person on the planet is moved by the shipping industry. Um, really uh, astonishing numbers there. Um, and shipping's a remains i think a, a huge leverage in the sense that it's i think about 0.2 0.3 percent of global gdp um now it also admits about 2.5 percent of emissions although emissions aren't the only thing if you make the right thing in the right place you can also reduce emissions but uh, uh clive bullen is curious you know as climate change is becoming a, a bigger issue uh, how does this affect supply chains and how much does shipping need to change to handle global warming Yes, it's quite a, it's a big question, I've got to say, uh, Michael, and it's something the sector is really looking at closely. The other thing you have, unlike a, say, for example, a domestic, and this could be anywhere, a, a domestic control on, for example, uh, roads, goods, vehicles and cars and automobiles, etc., is you have a very international community in shipping, which, you know, they move from one uh, state to another across sort of international areas sea, at sea. So you have to kind of 
you have to manage that at a very international level. And that's done through the UN's International Maritime Organization, where the pace tends to be along the lines of the sort of in the middle or the slowest uh, player and not perhaps the one the operators and the countries that are more progressive on this. So we, we, we have got a long way to go. Now, the UK government is looking at various things it can do to mandate certain rules for ships whilst they're in the UK waters or at UK ports. Uh, and indeed, domestic shipping, so those ships that only stay in Britain, they're looking at how you regulate that. Uh, but initiatives like plugging ships into local electricity supplies whilst they're in port, which mean that those ships can turn off their engines and ultimately the funnels that emit pollutants, including carbon, but also uh, other particulates, uh, can be turned off. So that is recognised as being a bit cleaner, locally at least. Obviously, you would still need to generate the electricity that you're going to pump into those vessels in a clean way. Um, but that that has challenges. That's huge infrastructure costs. The shipping community, you know, is very varied. Some of those ships are not ready for that. Others are asking. Some are not prepared to pay because a lot of be, a lot of infrastructure ports would need to build and they need to recharge that out to the shipping community as their customers. Uh, and then the final thing is, you know, and this this is an issue around the world is that we'd have to have really good energy networks, electricity networks locally, so that we don't, for example, plug a ship in and see all the lights of a small town go off. So it is a big challenge, but um, you know, you'll know, you see various governments, the UK government is doing a lot of uh, initiatives at the moment. We've got a, a clean maritime demonstration project and other initiatives. Uh, we're seeing that globally repeated uh, and shore power is one of many kind of options. There's also cleaner fuels, looking at hydrogen, uh, again, more costs uh, for infrastructure, but there's a huge amount going on, and it's probably the topic of several different uh, webinars in itself. Hmm. Well, one thing is, uh, through luck, I guess, uh, I was uh, able to tour late last year the port of Djibouti, or the, I should say the many ports of Djibouti, five, six major new ones there that are Chinese-owned, and I was over in Rotterdam last month and got to see, you know, there's, there's a lot of competition in the shipping amongst the various ports. Um, and Mark Cook points out, of course, it's interesting that China now owns Piraeus and ports in Spain. D does any of that ownership um, affect uh, BPA in any way? Or is it sort of these are the ports we trade with and who owns them is largely irrelevant? It doesn't really, but occasionally you get sort of political dynamics, of course. Now, now Britain went through a series of, uh, as I mentioned before, in, in terms of our uh, economic changes in the 1980s and 90s. In that time, we also liberalised, i.e. privatised, a lot of our national port infrastructure. Uh, and so you find that we, um, you know, and some would say that was a mistake, others would say it's been really beneficial, etc. But we did that and, and we've accepted foreign ownership of our ports, our strategic assets, etc. Uh, for those that, are, that have been sold off, not all of them, but some of them. And in terms of, you're absolutely right, Mike, what it's meant is we get money in, inward investment in from foreign sources uh, without the drain or, or the, you know, the kind of influence of government. Uh, you have to accept that there's going to be sort of a more independent strategy here and that government has less control over what's going on. But when you have a lot of, as Britain does, a lot of, of sort of medium sized ports in the global context, competing, it has driven uh, a, a sort of efficient network. Now, at the other end of the, tr the, the the chain, of course, if a port is operated by a foreign operator, we, we wouldn't really know too much difference. You know, if the goods are coming through, there might be some increased security risks, but the government is, is focused on those kind of activities and, and works with the shipping community. But for the most part, no, it, it, it's not a huge issue for us. Now, in Europe, they are looking at this because they're slightly more you could say behind or ahead, depending on what your view is, that they, they, they haven't done this liberalisation before. Mm -hmm. And what it's meant for places like Piraeus and, and in Greece is getting that Chinese money in. Uh, and, and what they're kind of looking at is that model of perhaps reserving some of the functions of a statutory port authority and allowing the operations, the, you know, the, the terminal ops, et cetera, and the, the cargo management and the infrastructure investment to be taken on by a, a, a kind of foreign player, which which has helps their their model. Yeah. It's interesting some of the conflicts. I mean, uh, uh, Djibouti's uh, had a uh, for the last few years a rolling uh, sort of legal dispute with Dubai Ports, which was managing, I believe, part of the port. And without commenting on the whys and the wherefores, 
my understanding is the dispute revolved largely around diversion, where Dubai ports was diverting uh, tonnage to various other ports in Somalia and the Gulf uh, to its own advantage, and Djibouti felt that as managing their port, they were disadvantaging Djibouti. So really an interesting area out there. But uh, just returning a little bit closer to home, you had a question for the audience. You wanted to ask about uh, how long they felt uh, uh, global trade imbalances will go. Just before we ask it, do you just want to kind of elaborate and pose the question properly? Well, and we'll get the poll. What up. I was going to see firstly, Mike, was just to see whether, I mean, and some people it may be, you know, nothing to do with, with their sort of uh, business activity, et cetera. But I just wonder whether there was a general feel that this, uh, I mean, I use the UK example, but it has been elsewhere, of course. We've had huge issues in North America. Uh, one of the slides, I think, if we go back, don't need to now, but if you look back, there was um, pictures of lots of ships queued up outside Long, Be Long Beach in LA. And, you know, those those kind of things. I just wanted to get a feel as to whether it's had an impact on the wider business community, some of the people that joined today. And then we've got this question here. How long do you think the imbalance will last? All right. Well, most of the audience has voted there. So, folks, do do get your votes in. I'll leave it open for just a few more seconds. Uh, and we'll just, uh, there we go. Well over half the audience has voted. Just about to close this now. Come on, people. There we go. Great. Uh, and just sharing the results with you, Richard. So, uh, uh, people, 55% uh, believing it's two years or uh, and 36% uh, one year. So, the vast bulk saying this is one to two years yet to go. Yeah, set to continue. Yeah. Now, uh, just to close, we've got time for just two quick uh, questions. Um, one is we saw um, a lot of turmoil um, out there earlier with the, I think it was the Port of Felixstowe and Southampton and London Gateway and others felt that they were being kind of unfairly tarred with the British industry's got a bit of a problem. What was behind all of that? Well, yeah, I can't, um, you know, Felix Stowe did a very good job, but they had a tough pandemic and they had some IT system issues, you know, went. <laughs> who hasn't, so to speak, big sort of changes there. And it did have a, a localized impact. And, and also because it's our largest port in terms of containers, it was really, you know, dealing with a sort of high pressures and high numbers of units going through. They also had a lot of um, government owned PPE was uh, in storage at the port using up very valuable uh, land and, and, and space, et cetera. But yes, the, the other ports, so Southampton and, uh, and London Gateway, which are actually are operated by DP World, who you just mentioned, they didn't experience the same levels of pressure. Now, there were some issues, you know, one or two people bringing goods through those ports did experience some, you know, increased delays and extra costs, but nowhere near as much as Felix Stowe unfortunately had. So, um, yeah, it was it was a bit of an unfortunate time, but glad to say that Felix Stowe is back to its efficient best now. And another question in a related vein that <clears throat> we have this uh, huge uh, controversy over uh, P&O's large scale dismissal of its staff. Uh, has that had any effect on uh, on uh, BPA members? Yeah, well, on the UK trade particularly. So effectively, for those who are less familiar, P&O is, is one of our larger uh, short sea ferry operators. Uh, and those ferries, as well as carrying individuals, private individuals, they also carry a huge amount of those driver accompanied uh, row row units I mentioned. And, and so what happened is they, they, they made redundant about 800 uh, crew and seafarers to move them over and, and to, to appoint new people on cheaper contracts. Now, some of that was to do with minimum wage, but a lot of it was to do rostering. And so we're going through quite a lot of uh, complexities now. The government didn't like this, as you can imagine, a lot of it, the economy didn't like it. And the government is now regulating to make sure that um, ferry operators are now unable to undermine the national minimum wage so um you know that's something that's going through the parliament here at the moment but the net effect was that those vessels that pno's crews used to operate uh, were taken out of service because firstly they didn't have anyone to operate them and then the new crew they brought in needed time to be trained and got used to those vessels and for places like dover and other um, ports on the irish sea we saw a big chunk of that capacity their, their shipping capacity just evaporate overnight. So you did see over the Easter holidays here in Britain, particularly in Dover in the short straits, so covering Eurotunnel as well, which carries a lot of freight, we saw a huge amount of congestion and huge queues outside places like the Port of Dover on motorways approaching them. And, and, and quite amazingly, the government has the measures to queue up lorries uh, and drivers uh, for many, many miles or kilometres approaching the ports. And that was a real challenge there. A lot of people without basic facilities to get food, toilets, 
you know, clean water, et cetera. It was a, a bit of a, um, you know, a challenge, but the ops were managed very well. And fortunately, it's, it's the vessels have come back online, so it's died away now. Well, that's fantastic. We've run to the end of time, sadly. I, I always know that because the audience started sending in their thanks. And, uh, and this has been a particularly uh, good session. And I've noticed as well a lot of uh, fellow uh, liverymen of the Worship Company World Traders here. So it's been a, an extremely good session. Um, what I'd like to just uh, close on, if, if I could, is that there's clearly a lot ahead. And we'd love to have you back as we see these trends. Uh, in particular, you closed on deregulation, and you and I were talking about the UK CA mark as a substitute for the CRE mark being yet another potential uh, bit of snagging in the system. A lot, lots to go for. Trade is far more exciting than people think, uh, I believe. Um, I have three quick rounds of thanks, if I may. Uh, firstly, to our sponsors. Uh, you've been always uh, good and kind at allowing us to, to look, as I say, at technology, economics, and finance. And, uh, really the technology and shipping has moved forward enormously we could spend a whole session just on that and the automation of ports um, you know for me uh personally I, I think one of the funniest things is it's uh just remind me what was his name again um, malcolm mclean wasn't it who invented the shipping container i always say he was uh, probably worse than hitler in the sense that he destroyed east london uh changed the entire road network of britain uh and you know led of course ultimately to the creation of tilbury so there's a lot that goes on there uh, behind the scenes, and we would love to cover it as, as we go ahead. We've got a number of other events, as ever, I won't read them out, do check out uh, on the website. It's a fascinating program that we're able to provide. Um, and I would like to close, if I might, uh, really with just thanks to you, Richard. Uh, great preparation, great slides, uh, great to have the opportunity to interact with you. Um, I'm afraid that we are unable to provide the technology of applause and so I have here my Korean karmic clapper. I'm afraid I brought it by air freight in my luggage back from Korea, <laughs> but here we go. And thank you very, very much for coming on board and we hope to see you again soon.